morning. Um, Ann Russett with Neighborhood and Development Services. Um, as the mayor mentioned, Alexa McDowell is here this morning to give you a presentation on the update that she did to the 2001 Downtown Historic Survey. The city has been working with Alexa for the past 15 months, and she's finalized the survey and is here to present her findings and recommendations. And Alexa did present this same presentation at a public meeting last night at the Old Capitol, and we had about 45 people in attendance, so we were able to get some feedback and comments um, at that meeting as well. So. With that, I'll turn it over to Alexa. Good morning, Alexa. It's nice to see you. Good morning. So glad to be here. Um, we're just going to walk through this, and, and I want to spend as much time as we need to providing the background so we understand um, the, the intent of the process and the findings that resulted from it. Um, so we started by um, reviewing, the, the presentation will go through uh, the review of the project, some discussion about what the National Register is and isn't, um, a discussion about landmark, local landmark status, and a summary of the findings and the recommendations. And of course, all of these pieces are included in the written report that's been submitted to um, to the neighborhood development. I always use the, I always go back to the planning department and I can never get it straight in my head, so I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> the project started um, with community engagement uh, last fall. And um, we have, over the course of the project, we've had multiple um, opportunities to engage the public. Last September, we started with a presentation at the Englert Theater, um, and we had, I would say, 60 to 75 people there. Um, that November, then we had a meeting with the um, local businessmen and um, property owners as a way to kind of address specific issues from the, um, to their specific to their positions. Um, then, of course, we had our meeting last night. And then uh, during the course of that period, I had a chance to talk to about 15 different people representative of a variety of um, perspectives, historic preservationists, city council people. Um, I talked to some downtown uh, business owners. I talked to um, a contact person at the university. So we had a nice variety of perspectives to um, kind of inform my thinking as I walked through this process, because obviously Iowa City as a university town it is more complicated than many other communities. And it was important for me to have those perspectives. It was important for me personally, but it was also important from the perspective of the city, because they wanted to make sure that I understood um, or had at least a sense of the different issues that were at play. So. The, the project began as a, essentially an update of a survey and evaluation project that was completed in 2001. Um, I think there are a couple important things to keep in mind about that, and that is over the course of 15 years, a lot of things have changed, and not just the composition of the downtown, but also um, as historic preservationists and um, people who are interested in keeping our communities vital, how we approach those things. There's many factors that have changed. The filters about understanding historic preservation and its value in maintaining a vital community have evolved as, the, as those issues have evolved. And so um, in many ways, m my perspective was different than Marla Svensson, who created that initial survey and evaluation, and, and not in any way to de denigrate the work she did, because if you've looked at any historic preservation documents in this community, you, her hand is on everything. Um, and she um, really created the foundation for our understanding of the historic um, context and resources that are in this community. Um, but time passes and, and our understanding of things changes. So I want you to understand that the filters changed a little bit. So the, the, I, the, um, the, the basic components of the project were to review which the document she had created, which is called a multiple property document. That's an official document that is used by the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service to identify 
um, historic resources and to create a system of evaluating those resources. So it's a standardization of evaluating historic significance, okay, for the purpose of National Register nomination. Um, the other thing is that she looked at a defined survey area and examined the buildings within that survey area. And on the image that you have in front of you, the, the um, map where you see the hatched outline in white, that was the survey area that Marlis examined. When uh, the project was uh, resurrected last year, the survey area was uh, downsized. So we had a nine block survey area that is illustrated there in the highlighted area. So that area is bound by Iowa Avenue on the, on the north, Gilbert on the east, Burlington on the south, and Clinton on the west. So nine square blocks. Um, the reason that the area was um, diminished was because primarily because of loss of historic fabric in the air, those outlying areas. I talked through this. This is uh, just an overview of the community engagement. So the multiple property document, as I stated, um, Marlis created a context. And context is about what was going on in history at the time. Um, these buildings, which are the physical representation of history, right? How those were constructed and what does that have to do with being significant or important? So she created basically a historical um, background of the establishment of Iowa City and its growth over time. And then she laid into that the physical representations of specific eras being the buildings. And she talked about how those changed, why they changed, you know, things like national natural disaster, um, establishment of the um, state capital here, loss of the state capital here, establishment of the university, um, growth of population, changes in um, who was doing business here, and how that impacted what the downtown looked like and how it functioned for the community. That's what the historic context was about. It was a big piece of the multiple property document. The other thing is, is that she outlined the standards. So if we're looking at a building in the downtown, how do we decide whether it in and of itself is significant to the, to the level that would establish it as being something that's eligible for the National Register? And she created an outline that said, we look at this, we look at this, we look at this. And I'll talk more specifically about that when I have an example to have in front of you. But that was an important part of the document and it's part of um, what was updated this time around. So my uh, responsibility was to review her work, to update it, <clears throat> and to do that, I, um, I do want to say that, that, that there's a significant amount of the language that is Marlis's language, and you need to understand that. I did not erase that work because it was already done, and it was well done. So my job was to update any references that had changed. So if there was a photograph of a building that she inserted there, I put a fresh photograph in it. If there was a change in um, the description of that building, I changed the description. <clears throat> so I updated the language. I, I addressed um, <clears throat> the numbers of building counts. So she referred to their X number of buildings in the survey area from this period. If that number had changed, I updated that number. I also inserted um, a number of supporting documents like historic photographs for reference. So we have some comparison to the current condition relative to the historical condition. I added Sanborn maps, anything else that I felt would um, would flesh that story out. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing that I did was I expanded the historical context to include the period from 1960 to 1985, which represents the urban renewal period um, across the nation, but in Iowa City specifically. Um, I reference here that, that I did include Marlis's um, intact multiple property document as an appendix of the uh, current report project, pop project report rather. So since the survey was completed in 2001, there are 15 buildings that have been raised in the existing survey area. Not That does not include that the area outside the boundary that was included in the previous survey area. 
Um, there are 13 new buildings constructed, and that's important to point out because what it does is it starts to shift the balance of um, proportion of new buildings to historic buildings. And when that balance shifts, you don't have a historic downtown anymore, you have a contemporary downtown. Um, we also lost one National Register listed building. Uh, the Van Patten House, as you know, was uh, raised after a fire that d damaged it significantly. And one um, independent resource or individually listed resource was added to the National Register, and that's the Iowa State Bank and Trust or Johnson County Savings Bank, which was also historically rehabilitated, beautiful building. Um, one of the things Mar uh, Marlis did that I thought was interesting is that she counted the number of buildings that remain in the downtown by era to give us kind of a sense of how long that built history is. And in the 2001 survey for that uh, two decade period of 1860 to 1880, there were 24 buildings built in that era, and there remain 24 buildings constructed during that time frame. From 1880 to 1900, there were 20, and now we only have 13. And this note here indicates that, that sometimes an apples to apples comparison was difficult because of the language that she used and the fact that the, that the survey area had changed. Um, but to clarify, in, in in the current survey area today, 47 of 115 buildings were constructed during the period of 1880 to 1900. From 1900 to 1920, 20 buildings remain in the survey area, or, or did in 20, and now we have 19. From 20 to 40, there were 12, now we have seven. Um, from 1940 to 60, there were seven buildings, and now we have three that representative of that construction period. And from 1960 to 1985, Marlis didn't count those, but today we have 14 resources representative of that construction era. The thing that I want to point out is, is that it's important to understand that we have buildings that are very old, um, and that we have a number of buildings that were constructed um, during uh, prior to 1900. But I think you need to understand that the date of construction is not representative of what the buildings look like. So here we have the airliner, which everybody knows and has been world famous for many decades now. Um, but th there is a building that was constructed prior to 1900, but it has, for a very long time, not looked like a building that was constructed pri prior to 1900. In 1950, it got a brand new facade, and that's it. And so the, I, I did not separate the, the buildings that still look like they're built in 1880 from those that have been changed to give you a number, but this is more commonly uh, what we're finding. So we have a building that was constructed early, but it's not representative of the character. So my point is, is that if half of our buildings were constructed between, before 1900, the visual character of the downtown is not that half of the buildings were constructed before 1900. I do want you to see some of the buildings that represent those eras, however. The Franklin Printing Building is a National Register listed resource. It's the building here on the left with the um, pink storefront. And its uh, partner adjacent to it was constructed within a couple years after it. These are both two early, um, two of the earliest buildings in the downtown, and certainly the ones uh, that, that are most indicative of that visual character. These are the three um, Italianate era buildings. They represent the largest intact block of Italianate era, Italianate style buildings retained in the downtown. The Stillwell building is on the left, and then the two other large bays are actually a remnant of a larger building that was called the IXL block. Um, and so those are now function um, autonomously, but they were part of a larger unit. From 1920, the Englert is a very solid and important representation of that construction era in terms of its style, and it's, and it's a National Register listed building. Uh, the Kresge building, which is adjacent to the, the um, 
six-story Hotel Jefferson and the Yonkers building there next to each other. Those were constructed in that period between 1920 and 1940. Um, they're important because they represent a, a shift in commercial retail practices. So the rise of the department store and the five and dime, which is very indicative of this period and time across the country. This building, which everyone knows, um, as Gabe's was constructed in the 1950s as the Eldon Miller Company, and it was a trucking company. And this is the Meerschaum Travel uh, Service Building, which was constructed by the Meerschaum, so, so they, they were responsible for this. It was designed um, during, it was constructed during the urban renewal era, and it was designed to accommodate two additional stories, which were never constructed. Um, there has been some alterations of the, um, the window glazing for the storefronts, but otherwise, it looks like it's a historic photograph. So, urban renewal. Um, I'll tell you that, that in the conversations that I've had with people, urban renewal remains a painful episode in Iowa City to lots of people. Um, for those um, who, who haven't studied the history of urban renewal, um, you know, it was a period um, with a, a motivation that was sound. You know, there were a lot of communities all over the country with um, neighborhoods that were severely deteriorated and old buildings that um, communities didn't know what to do about. And this idea about removing them and building something new caught on and large swaths of buildings in communities of many different sizes. I live in Minneapolis now and and you know some of the most important buildings downtown were demolished as a part of the urban renewal. In Iowa City that is also the case. Um, where the Capitol Theater is, the blocks that came down there were close to 200 buildings that were demolished to accommodate that. Um, the the positive thing about ur urban renewal, there is this, this painful piece of it, you know, a loss, you know, and change and, you know, things that some, some are difficult sometimes. One of the best things that came out of ur urban renewal is the Ped Mall. And um, the, the, the introduction of a Ped Mall in communities was a, a relatively common tool that was used in urban renewal projects. And a colleague sent me a great study uh, just yesterday, and uh, which I'll take a closer look at, but it was completed by Fresno State University in 2013. And they did a survey of pedestrian malls um, that were constructed as part of the urban renewal um, programs across the country. And they identified 200 pedestrian malls, and of those, 89% are gone. They've been returned to a vehicular roadway. So I've always felt, without the statistics to back it up, that Iowa City is unusual in that their pedestrian mall is a very successful space, remains a very successful space, as, as a way, as a gathering place, as a support to retail, as a, a pedestrian transit. All of those things remain vital and vibrant in the downtown because of the Ped Mall. It was a big uh, piece of that. Um, if you look at the image here, we're on um, College Street, standing near Wells Fargo, where ICDD is at Clinton, looking to the northeast. And I apologize, I don't know how to use my red arrow here, but um, toward the corner, we're looking towards where Plaza Center 1 is. So you get a sense of, in the 1940s, what the space felt like. and. I mean, if you imagine yourself walking in the Ped Mall now, all of these cars, I mean, it's a completely different, it's different in, in the level of activity, it's the dealing, it's different in the sense of connection to the businesses, it's different in the sense of um, um, intimacy. You know, when you're in the Ped Mall, you're walking through the Ped Mall and, and there's a tree canopy and the, the restaurants have their, um, decks out with the lights on them. It's a lovely gathering place, very different than this space. 
This is the um, standing in front of um, the hotel, which has recently been re renamed The Graduate, right? Looking due west, and so we have Plaza Center 1 on the right, and the College Block, which is on the National Register of Historic Places, on the left. This is uh, taken as the work for constructing the pedestrian mall was underway. And we're standing in the same position today, or not today, a few months ago. I peeked down there yesterday, um, and lots of changes underway. So the pedestrian mall was, was kind of the, it came near the end of the urban renewal work here in Iowa City, but it was the anchor. It was the thing that tied these, these uh, different elements of revitalization together. And it remains a cohes cohesive um, part of that. Just to, to just summarize the issue, uh, urban renewal as a context, urban renewal is a nationwide um, phenomenon, right? And so when we think about historic context and evaluating resources um, for significance, we want to see how it fits in the larger picture. So how does Iowa City and their experience in urban renewal fit within that larger context? And usually the contexts are big. So if we're talking about a commercial context, con commerce across the country occurred, right? And, and it had um, patterns of growth and change. But the urban renewal as a concentrated, um, intensely focused period in time that created enormous change. I, I can't think of a single event, civil rights perhaps, or, me, or um, construction of roadways would be um, other equivalents, but something that made such an, an enormous focal impact that changed the way people think about things and the way they functioned in their communities. Um, and of course, it was a defining moment here. It uh, impacted the character of the downtown. In, in Iowa City, I have identified that the period of um, significance for the urban renewal context begins with in 1977, which is Things and Things and Things was constructed, placed in service in December of that year. Things and Things and Things was actually constructed as the result of a fire as opposed to some of the other projects that were picked, handpicked and said we're going to build the new building for the Hawkeye Barbershop, for example, um, or Hill, Bill Hill Music was, um, they had identified as that as part of the planned urban renewal project, but the building that things and things and things in um, had been in for many years burned. And the timing of the burn resulted in new construction that happened to be completed before anything else was done. And it was touted as the first successful um, product of the urban renewal um, program in Iowa City, which had been under discussion for uh, almost 15 years by then. So that's when the urban renewal program in terms of its manifestation in the downtown begins here and it ends in 1985 with the completion of the Holiday Inn. The next piece of um, the project after the um, review of the, the um, the multiple property document and the development of the context was to take a look at the site inventory forms. So site inventory forms are a, um, a reporting um, document that's created by the State Historic Preservation Office. And the state monitors um, and re um, controls, I guess, um, reports and National Register nominations and evaluations of properties that happen in Iowa. So for every building that's reviewed, we fill out this form, we send it to the state, the state takes the data and enters it in the computer so that it's a searchable um, resource. And for every building that, that was completed during the 2001 survey, Marlis completed an, a, a site form. So my responsibility was to review all of those site forms for accuracy update the photographs, and to complete new site forms for properties that um, have been constructed. So even the ones that are new got a site form. And the advantage of the work today, I said that about things having changed in 15 years, when Marlis did those site forms, she was working from paper. You know, I had the extreme advantage that I could go online and search for Sanborn fire insurance maps and newspaper clips and historic images which are boundless in this community because of the historians that have done so much work at the, the public library and the State Historical Society. The collections of historic information about this community is mind-blowing. Um, 
And, and so I had the advantage. So, so what we have now are site forms that are updated, uh, additional information provided, so there's a lot more images. And um, in addition to having the site forms that will then go to the state and then be searchable, then, then all of the support documents that I, um, that I found. So if I downloaded an, uh, a, Iowa, a Sanborn fire insurance map to record the history of a building, they um, have been then provided to your, um, the city staff so that people who are interested in their buildings, they can come and get information about whatever um, newspaper I downloaded, whatever city directory I downloaded, whatever historic image I attached that building. So it's a very, um, now very deep and useful tool, I think. And then the other piece of that was um, to evaluate those buildings today to see how much historic integrity, and we'll talk about that in a second, is retained, and then decide whether or not they're um, eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, and if so, how they're categorized, and we'll talk about that too. Historic integrity, the National Park Service requires when we discuss historic integrity that we deal with all seven of these um, items on the list here. In the downtown, basically, it came down to is the design of the historic building, do, do, do we recognize it when we look at it, and have the materials changed to a degree that makes it unrecognizable, or makes it, um, some buildings are reconstructed, so they might look kind of historic, but there's nothing about them that's historic because all of the brick, all of the windows, all of the details are from 20, you know, 2015, and that's a breach of integrity, so that impacts how we think about them in terms of their ability to contribute to historic significance. So I evaluated um, the, all of the buildings that were urban renewal era or older than 50 years. Um, the new ones would, would not be evaluated for historic integrity. I put this in here because you have a local historian, Jan Full, who is, um, has, um, is among the, the most um, prolific and um, skilled historians, professional historians in your state, in our state. And she wrote um, the multiple property listing, which is like an umbrella document that when a person looks at um, evaluating downtowns for their eligibility to the National Register, this is the document that we use. And it's called Iowa's Main Street Commercial Architecture. She wrote it in, 20, in 2002. And, and the gist of this is, is that, that um, downtown commercial buildings are different than, say, if I evaluated a church or a school or a house, because of their inherent function as retail, which retail changes and changes and changes and changes, we have to allow for that reality. So when we evaluate historic integrity of a commercial building, we, we, th we think about the fact that those changes that have been made are part of the story of a commercial building. Change is inherent. And so the, the lens that we use is different for a commercial building than other resources. So this is a good example of um, evaluating historic character. So the image on the right, does everybody know this building? Okay, I, I hoped I picked one that no one would not know what this building is. When I looked at this, I went, <coughs> ook. Right? I, and I went, ook, because my eyes don't like that aesthetic. Right, and um, and I was distracted by the sign. So I, my initial response to this building was, this cannot be a contributing building. Um, it has to have been changed in, in a way that impacts its integrity. And I confess to my own short-sightedness as as a as a tool for learning in that you don't judge a book by its cover, right? It's a simple, you know, my mom taught me that how many years ago. Um, once I started reading about the history and found a historic photograph, what I realized was that this building, which again is a remnant of a larger building, which was three bays and now is two bays, was remodeled, the whole new facelift in the 1930s. That was a really common thing because people People wanted their buildings not to look like these old Victorian, you know, things with big fancy hoods and all of that um, 
um, applied ornament that is indicative of Victorian and at this point old fashioned. They didn't want it to look that way. They stripped all of that off and they created this very modern facade. And what I realized by looking past the awning is that this um, cubicle form is still in place on the right hand, of, right hand side of the facade. The recessed entrance, which is very boxy, is still there. The box on the left, a display window, is still there. The brick facade, flat, no applied ornament, only a change in, uh, they call it corbeling around the edge that creates kind of this frame around the upper story, is still there. The glass block is still there. The three punched windows, the bottom one has been altered, but the other ones look like they did. So in evaluating historic integrity, it's important to find either descriptive um, text in a, in a newspaper that talks about any changes, or an image that helps us place it in the context of its time both when it was constructed and when it was changed. So this building um, is a contributing resource to the historic district because it represents a specific period in time and helps us understand what was going on at that time in this community. So the National Register of Historic Places, excuse me one sec. I'll start by saying that we have two we have two parallel paths here. There's the National Register of Historic Places and there's local landmark and it's important to understand how those things relate. Um, but to begin with, they are two separate paths, right? The National Register really is about um, a listing by the National Park Service that's recognized by the State Historic Preservation Office that's recognized locally. It's an honorific designation, which means is it's, it's used as a tool by many com communities to say, we recognize that what we have here is important. We recognize that our buildings say something about our history, and we want people to understand that that's important. We want people who come to visit our communities to to um, see that we hold up the things that we think are important um, and, and invite them to study them, to understand them. So having information about the fact that you have historic National Register historic resources is important. People come to communities because they're interested in history. They stay longer. Statistically, it's been proven that when people travel and they go someplace, they stay longer at places that have history and that celebrate their history and have information about their history that's available to travelers. So folks who would stay for a day to do business stay for three days to look at the community when, when that is um, promoted and marketed. So the National Register does that. The National Register is a no strings undertaking. So what that means is that if it's a building, if it's a bridge, if it's a school, if it's a district, it's on the National Register, the property owners retain their rights and the buildings are unprotected. So from, a, from the perspective of a property owner who might be concerned about maintaining their rights, the National Register does not um, impede that position. At the same time, the National Register doesn't provide any protection. So for individuals um, or communities that want to protect their historic resources, the National Register won't do that in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> the, the National Register does open up um, some possibilities for financial assistance, which let's face it, with historic buildings, people need commonly need assistance to be able to rehabilitate buildings. Both the state and the federal historic tax credit programs have been phenomenally successful. State of Iowa has been the leader in the Midwest on using state historic tax credits to revitalize communities. You can look at Davenport, which is, was on the, um, has been undergoing a miraculous sort of revitalization using historic tax credits. Fort Dodge has, has used them. Sioux City has used them. Des Moines has used them remarkably. Dubuque has used them. Um, there are 
three or four historic tax credit rehabs in Iowa City. It's astonishing to me. Now, the, the bank that was just completed is a remarkable example. The Englert Theater, the Glove, um, the Glove Fa Hawthorne Glove Factory. Um, but but why is that? That's an answer to be to me. That's a question to be answered. It's a fabulous tool, um, and it remains um, in a, in an era when tax credit programs of all kinds are being scrutinized for their viability and their ability to, to benefit the economy, one of the ones that survived is the historic tax, historic tax credit. So that should tell you that, it's, um, that it is successful, it's recognized as being successful. An important tool, if a building is not on the National Register, it's a tool that's not available to them. The, um, the issue about the National Register and controls is that if a property owner takes federal money in the form of a grant or historic tax credits, they do have to follow the Secretary's standards and guidelines. And in my view, that's a reasonable thing. If you're going to take money to historically rehabilitate a building, then you should historically rehabilitate a building. Um, and so that is the case. You take money, you, you follow the guidelines. You don't take money, you don't have to. Okay? The National Register of Historic Places typically um, it is the, the kind of general guideline is we look at buildings that are 50 years of age or older. Um, there are criteria that are used to filter and evaluate whether or not a building is significant. Usually what we're talking about is criterion A, which is are these build is this building or buildings associated with a significant um, era or pattern in history. I pointed out urban renewal as a, as a logical cool one specific to that particular era. Commerce in a downtown is typically the criterion or the context that's um, focused on for commercial buildings for obvious reasons. And then criterion C really relates to the architecture. So does it represent a specific era of architectural style? Is it representative of an important architect? Sometimes in buildings that um, in, in modern buildings, sometimes there'll be some sort of a change in how a building is constructed that might be, have been revolutionary at the time, those sorts of things that are related to the structure. So in evaluating uh, all of the buildings downtown, these are the two criteria that I looked at, with the exception of the um, urban renewal period, because many of those, most of those resources are not 50 years of age. They, they will be in a couple years, but so we're close to uh, that tipping point, um, a case for special consideration would have to be made, which means that um, developing a um, systematic comparative analysis to other um, comparable communities that underwent um, historic um, urban revi revitalization efforts would have to be done in order to say this is a really special case. Local landmarks, um, because this, the National Register of Historic Places doesn't have any teeth, it's honorific, communities like this one have a local landmark ordinance for the purpose of protecting their historic resources. And typically, a local landmark also has a design and review component. So in the case that, a build, that a, uh, there's a, a district in the downtown, the, the district can exist without local landmarks, but there will be no protections for any of the buildings. So um, the local landmark, and, and you do this in your residential district, so I'm sure you're familiar with it, um, but by the use of the local landmark ordinance, that is the layer, the overlay, that, that would provide the, the protection to the resources that are in a district or individual resources, okay? Um, Properties can be in the National Register, not landmarked, as I said. And the, these two things often happen at the same time, mostly because once the significance is established for the National Register, um, and, we, and we know what boundaries are or what individual resources are, the local landmarks 
um, follows the same criteria for evaluation, and so all of that work is in place. So it's a matter of looking at the best application of the local landmark ordinance given the circumstances of the community. Um, the other big difference is, is that the local landmark evaluates exteriors only. A National Register individually eligible resources in particular also consider retention of character on the interior um, and the local landmark in, um, in review process also only reviews the exteriors. So the project report has been submitted, it's been online, and there's also a hard copy of it. Um, it includes a summary of findings, recommendations, and then an appendices that includes everything I could think of that you might use. So in the summary of findings, I used a couple visual um, uh, tables and maps to help you understand um, how these things have been evaluated and how they're designated. So there's a long table um, with some thumbnails in it that, that I'll show you so you can see what it is. But um, each one of the resources in the district have been identified as um, either currently listed on the National Register of Historic Places, considered individually eligible for listing on the National Register, key contributing resources, which means that they're considered um, to, to have, a, that perhaps their historic integrity does not allow them to be individually eligible, but because of a local significant factor, they need to be called out separately, um, or they are called out separately because their significance is, is somewhat elevated. Then there are um, uh, contributing resources and non-contributing resources. So. Non-contributing resources are those that are not associated with the urban renewal pro uh, uh, program and are less than 50 years old. So any of the new construction is, are counted as non-contributing automatically. The other remaining buildings that are counted as non-contributing resources are those that do not maintain a sense of historic integrity, either because they have been um, covered up so that you can't see what's behind them. For example, on Washington Street, we have a building that has the white metal facade. Okay, that, that's a non-contributing resource. Um, or a building, as I mentioned, that's been rehabbed and it might look like it's old, but it's new, it's a new face. Um, and there are, Bo James is an example of that, and then there's another one um, right adjacent to that building. So um, by, by the level of a loss of integrity, those are not contributing. This is an example of the resource table so that you just see what you're looking at. The number on the left is the site form number, so that's the number that the, the State Historic Preservation Office uses in their database. Here's a little thumbnail, um, the address, the historic name, and um, I'll just say that everybody argues about what a historic name is because it can be very complicated about how that's done. I tried to maintain the, the names that um, Marlis had landed on when she did the evaluations in 2001 unless I found that there was a really significant association that, that would um, warrant changing that. Construction date and then their status in terms of whether they contribute to a potential historic district or not. So in this case, these three buildings are contributing resources, they're considered key resources in large part because um, this block of Clinton between um, Iowa Avenue on the north and Washington Street on the south faces the Pentecrest. It is the anchor on that side. It's the, it is the streetscape that is the most intact. It's the streetscape that um, directly relates to a national um, landmark site the old Capitol and the Pentecrest. And so the mere fact that that facade, that that streetscape remains intact elevates its, its significance. In addition to that, there are a number of um, representations of um, evolution of facades over time, including the airliner and Ewers, which was a Victorian era building that was changed in 23. Alexa, I hate to interrupt, but yes. could you go back to the previous slide? There's one small question I have. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the third item, eligible as a contributing resource. I'm looking at the maps that you have, and, and you don't have anything labeled literally as eligible as contributing resource, but what you do have is contributing resource. Is that 
That's Does the that same refer thing. to the buildings that are eligible as contributing yeah. resource? I don't even know why I said that eligible as. I could. It should just say contributing resource. So there's no differentiation there. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, here is um, a, a map which is um, the, sur the entire survey area and the light gray are all the non-contributing resources. And as I noted, the vast majority of those are non-contributing because they're new. Um, many of those date to just before um, 2001 and then the 15 inter years that are intervening. Um, the black indicates contributing resources. The, um, of course, now I have my, let me put my glasses on so I can remember for sure. I'm so small I can't see it. Royal blue is, are the National Register listed resources. The um, yellow is the key contributing. And red are considered individually eligible. So you can see that there's a concentration of um, resources that whatever their static status designation are, they contribute either as individually key contributing or contributing resources um, to a National Register district. And those um, in, in the upper left-hand corner, so that is the block that I just spoke about, the one to the south of that running along uh, Washington and continuing to the east. So we have some very good concentrations, including those around College Street um, and south of Buke facing the pedestrian mall. And the pedestrian mall is also counted as a contributing resource. So the recommendations uh, that I made, number one, are to proceed with placing the, a proposed district on the National Register of Historic Places. That district um, is indicated here by the green boundary. Um, some discussion at the meeting last night um, suggested that we look at pushing the boundary um, on East College Street to include the Carnegie Library. So the Carnegie is that red island in the middle of the non-contributing new construction. And um, so that would be something that um, that, that I would be willing, or that you should be willing, pardon me, to look at as, um, the, as this proceeds, to be able to, to pull that out and to include the Carnegie. And the point made last night was a good one. The Carnegie Library um, is significant in the fact that it was a part of the, the philanthropy of Andrew Carnegie. Um, Carnegie's story is very rich for lots of different reasons, on the good and on the bad, but he was a central person to the development and the dissemination of knowledge in the early early 20th century. Um, in Iowa, there were 100 Carnegie libraries that were constructed. I believe that that's the most in any state in the union. Um, and so his impact um, in funding the construction of public library is just uh, really critical to the history of uh, the state and this community. So getting it listed would be important, and sometimes it's easier to include it in a historic district than it is to undertake an individual National Register nomination. So the idea of, uh, of modifying that. Um, but as you can see, it includes um, most of that area. Um, it would also include, as noted, the Ped Mall, uh, Black Hawk Park. Um, the other idea that was presented last night is that, that the alleys in Iowa City have a life of their own. Um, and I love overlooked the alleys, but the alleys certainly um, should be considered. And one of the points that were made was that, you know, the back doors to lots of the bars and entertainment places, people use that. They go out the back and there's always a lot more life in the alleys. And Iowa City just because of um, the, the conditions here um, and the activity here. And so th those would also be evaluated and considered. Um, so here, the, that's the potential boundaries. So what, what would a process about a National Register nomination involve? So the, the primary thing would be to um, do any additional refinement of the context that have been developed. In particular, the National or the Urban Renewal Project um, revitaliza revitalization era would have to be looked at in a lot more detail. And as I noted, there would have to be some comparative analysis to, to place 
the, the story in Iowa City against other experiences in communities in Iowa and perhaps across the country um, in order to, to really be able to elevate that case, in part because it's a special case for significance. So um, additional time would be made to do that. Um, the, the idea of going back and looking at things like the alleys, whether or not to change the boundary to include the Carnegie Building, um, any reevaluation of resources that were designated as not individually eligible, but people think, you know, I really think that's eligible. There should be time spent to make sure that those nuances are properly addressed. Um, there's just the process of photography, uh, freshing the photography, creating a form that has all of the maps, all, you know all of the stuff that goes with that, and the writing. And then it's a formal process. Um, this is a process that is established and, and um, dictated by the State Historic Preservation Office that involves a, um, an individual preparing a National Register nomination, sending it to the State Historic Preservation Office. The, the historians there review it. They provide their comments in a conversation by phone or in person. The person that's preparing the nomination um, does those revisions and adds information. They send it back to the State Historic Preservation Office who may ask for more information um, or um, details or clarity of thought. It's revised again and, and at the point that the state reviewers say this is completed to the degree that we believe that it um, will be accepted, then it goes to the state nomination review committee and that is a volunteer board made up of um, architects and archaeologists, uh, archaeologists and historians and um, a, a variety of backgrounds. They read it. Um, three times a year they meet and um, the, the nomination preparer presents the nomination and they vote. This board votes that they believe that it's eligible for the National Register or that they don't. If they believe it is, then it's forwarded to the National Park Service and the National Park Service reviews it. So it is a... Um, a process and a very careful process because it's a, uh, it's a and it's important um, designation and they take that part very seriously. And again, the register provides no protection. It would just be a condition precedent for future funding opportunities for the businesses. Am I yes, understanding sir. that correctly? Okay, thank you. Um, the next recommendation is to proceed with local landmark designation for the purpose of providing the, the protections that the National Register does not provide. Um, at, at our uh, meeting last night, there, of course, was conversation about this, and I think that the, the important point that was made, and then I'll reiterate here, is, is that 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 process, while it relies on the National Register in terms of the National Register lays the groundwork, I mean, the, 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 they create the, that creates the, the document um, and identifies the resources. It's really up to the city, to the city staff, the Historic Preservation Commission and the people in the community to, f to figure out how to nuance the designations to fit the needs of the community. And that's a process, and in this community, I think it's, it's fair to say that that's an, a delicate and important process. Um, and so, but, but I think it's a very important process. And to reiterate, it, if there's no landmark status, you'll have buildings, on, but there's a National Register, that's an important piece, but it does not protect the resources. So, I just put this back up here to reiterate the fact that any, any building that is designated as individually eligible or key contributing according to the local ordinance is then eligible for landmark status. Okay? Um, the, if a National Register district was um, created that followed these boundaries, a national or a local landmark district could follow these boundaries or it could be uh, representative of a smaller area so it could target an area. So it, it is not it is not a um, apples to apples. If we do this with the National Register, you have to do this with landmark. So a lot of give and take in the middle there. Um, I just stated that so I won't go back to it. So, you know, I think the other thing that and to me, it is in many ways um, central to this idea is that 
if protecting the historic resources of the downtown is an important thing, it has to be at the front of the conversation. So if a developer comes to the city and says, I, you know, I'm interested in doing this, then part of the conversation, and it involves historic buildings, part of the conversation has to be, okay, how can we help you rehabilitate a historic building? What, what um, information can we get, give you? What incentives can we provide you that's going to help you make sense of rehabilitating a historic building as opposed to demolishing a historic building to make room for a new building? Um, I heard over and over again in my conversations that people need, this needs to be incentivized. And that's not just about money, it's about support, it's about providing information. Last night people were confused, you know, it's overwhelming all of this information for people who have never gone through a historic uh, National Register designation, let alone people who haven't gone through um, doing a historic rehabilitation. Um, it's taken me years to get my mind wrapped around this. So I'm not at all um, surprised that people would be overwhelmed by it. So in my view, it's the city's um, it is in a position to help ease that. And if, and if the desire is to protect the historic resources of the downtown, the historic character of the downtown, um, then the tools that are available need to be made available to the people who are interested in doing that. Um, and so part of that is, um, you know, historic rehabilitation is the number one way. Um, it's green building. It's the best way to be ecologically mindful about construction. You know, we can't get around the fact that when you demolish a building, that stuff goes someplace. Um, it's a loss of material, and in buildings that are um, have historic um, materials inside and out, not only are you putting all of that in a landfill, but you're losing all of that beautiful material. So it's on the front end of ecologically minded development, environmentally friendly development, and, and it can be promoted in that way. Um, Many people who are doing historic rehabilitation are thinking about, boy, I'd like to do my building, but it's old and I know that current zoning codes are not going to let me do this or this or this. Um, the idea that the um, international existing building code allows some flexibility in applying um, zoning or uh, code requirements to historic buildings, that's important for people to understand. It allows them to be creative in how they adapt their building for the, the use that they're interested in. Um, and, and then exploring, and I know there's been some work being done, some creative thinking about how to facilitate rehabilitation or promoting rehabilitation, but continue to push that about um, zoning issues. I know there's some um, parking issues using TIF, you know, all of those kind of things. That's your bailiwick and you do it well. But those things have to be um, accessible to people who are interested. Um, pursue and promote financial incentives, historic tax credits, I won't talk any more about that, but they are very useful and um, having information and someone at hand that can explain those to people who are interested in them is an important uh, thing for you to offer. And then I think it's really important to continue with partnerships. Um, locally, the Iowa City Downtown District, of course, is a central um, player in this, and it's very important to maintain that relationship and conversation about how is it that we maintain economic vi viability among all of the challenges that retailers and downtown business people have, especially in historic buildings. So how do we make that work? And, and they're in a position to provide information that, that um, others are not. And the Historic Preservation Office is always an important partner. They um, they follow. They're the ones that are processing historic rehabilitations, National Register nominations. They know what the standards are. They know other examples to provide that will help you um, try to make decisions. And Iowa Economic Development Authority has now become kind of the central processing um, arm of the government that deals with you know work, workforce housing tax credits, historic tax credits, community development programs all of those kind of things, and so they're also a critical source. 
Um, you guys know how to access this, but um, Jessica has downloaded um, the report and all the appendices. The site forms are, you know, like this thick, and so um, they're all in d digital form, and you guys have them, but they're not on online yet. But people. Um, are aware that they can contact Jessica and um, have access to the site forms. Maybe is the site forms online? The support documentation isn't either. So at any rate, they are accessible. Um, and you know, I, I do want to point out um, that that there were. You know, there are always people who are so important when you when you come into a community. That I mean, I'm very familiar with Iowa City, but I hadn't worked here, and um, that make that. Your ability to do a job and do it well, um, it, you know, it happens because people are willing to help you. Jessica certainly was critical to that, and so was Bob Micklow um, before he, as I said last night, fled. I, I'm half afraid that I scared him out of here, but um, <laughs> he, he was very um, passionate and helpful through this process. Jenilee Swain um, was the acting chair at the time. She is also retired um, as this project closed out, but she was very thoughtful and helpful in uh, guiding me through some of the, um, the, the processes. The, the local archives here are fabulous, as I said. The, the local the public library is um, has so much stuff available online, and those things are super helpful. Nancy Bird spoke with me on multiple occasions and was helpful in pointing out the issues that, from that perspective, exist and the challenges of supporting the downtown business people in historic buildings. Um, there, you also have a lot of local professional historians and also. Um, um, people who pick it up as their avocation just because they love it, and so there's a, a plethora of information about the city. Um, and then, you know, I've had a lot of people who just spoke to me because they were interested. So thank you, and, and thank the community for their support for this project. I think it's certainly there. Super great job, Alexa. Um, you've done a fabulous job of putting this report together and presenting it to us. So we have an opportunity to ask questions about what is being recommended and about the facts that have been presented and so on. I would like to ask, why wasn't um, Starbucks and the mill included on the designation? Those appear to be uh, historic structures right there on Burlington Street. I, <clears throat> pardon me, I need, I need to go look back at Starbucks because two people asked me about it last night. My recollection about that building is, is that there was later work done on it so that the materials of the facade are not old. So it's one of those buildings that looks like it's old, that's not old. But I'll double check that because two people asked about that last night. And the reason that the, the, the mill is counted as a contributing resource, so it is a contributing resource, but it's outside the boundaries. And the reason that it's outside the boundaries is that the, the way that, that um, uh, defining the boundaries of a potential district are undertaken is that in the end, when you make a list of the resources in a district, those that are in the contributing, which would be the individually eligible, the already listed and the contributing resources, and non-contributing, there's a tally. And what you can't have is the weight of the non-contributing be too heavy. And you also can't gerrymander. So I couldn't make the boundary go down just to pull in the mill. So the mill is a contributing resource, but because Burlington Street is otherwise gone of historic resources, it's like a, a tooth in a set of missing teeth. Now, pardon me, if, if I will go back and look at Starbucks, and I apologize, I looked at that one probably nine months ago. Um, if in the case that the Starbucks could be counted as a contributing resource, it might make some sense of pulling in the mill in the boundary. So again, that's one of those things in the process of moving forward with the National Register nomination would look at those issues that people bring up if they have information or a different understanding. The airliner you say is a key um Contributor, yes. Um, in in this, but earlier I heard you say that visually, um, it doesn't. It's not indicative of its um, era, because it was built before 1900. Um, but in the 19, but it it was changed mm -hmm. around the 1950 or something like that. Right. So I, I'm just, if you can give some clarification why this is now considered a key contributor. Sure. So it's it's. 
when we look at it, it's not it's not visually characteristic of its construction date. It is visually uh, um, characterized by its alteration date, which is more than 50 years old. So in and of itself, the change is considered historic. So um, it, it's the same scenario as when we looked at the Deadwood. So the Deadwood does not look like, it, it, that building dates to 1876 or something. Um, and it was changed in the 30s and it looks that way now. But the change is now more than, well more than 50 years. So if the change occurred more than 50 years ago, it, it is in and of itself historic. So that's why the airliner is. Thanks. Okay? You're welcome. Did you look at a couple of things that um, I haven't heard brought into this conversation would be the um, the downtown riverfront crossings master plan, which you know had a it, its focus was on development opportunities both in the downtown and riverfront crossings, mm -hmm. with an eye toward historic preservation and since it's part of our comprehensive plan, all the factors that might contribute to how growth in the downtown is envisioned. Did, did you have an opportunity to look at that plan in terms of is the surveying, is the survey that you generated um, consistent with the, the way the downtown riverfront crossings master plan envisions future growth in the downtown? Um, I looked at that months ago, and um, there were inconsistencies between how they evaluated the buildings in the survey area with the way that I evaluated the buildings in the survey area. Mm -hmm. um, I did not um, go into any consideration about how anything south of Burlington and the plans for that area, right. how they relate to this, um, the work that I was doing. But certainly there were inconsistencies in how they evaluated. And they made some recommendations about how um, new growth should be introduced in the downtown that I do not support from a historic preservation perspective. I can add to that a little bit. Staff has begun to look at how that downtown and riverfront crossings master plan relates to what Alexa has done. It looks like in that master plan, they probably took um, the resources and what would be historic from Marlis's 2001 survey. I'm assuming that's what they did since they didn't have a historian on staff. There are some areas um, marked for infill development on that master plan that are included as uh, contributing resources in Alexa's historic district, specifically a couple buildings like the Kresge and uh, Yonkers on Washington Street. And um, in the master plan, for instance, for those particular buildings, they talk about having some kind of, I don't know, parking garage infill, but maintaining a street and storefront focus. Mm -hmm. And there are things that could be done if a local district happened to maybe maintain the facade of the historic building, add something more tower-like or new to the back of the building, and still keep, sorry, the historic district. There are a few inconsistencies, but very few. Okay, thanks. I just want to ask you as, um, I don't know this question for you for or for how or for the council, but as a new council member, I really would like to know what does it make different to make more building historic or to make that district, that, the, the, the grid boundary, like the whole thing is district. I understand you were saying early, our buildings say something about our history. Mm -hmm. But examples, the airlines, you said it's been built a long time ago, it has been king, and when you look at it, it doesn't give you the look that this is an old building. Why, why does it make difference? Uh, I just don't get this. Well, it, and, uh, and you're not alone in not getting it. It's, uh, to me, when I look at, um, there, let's see here. There are some places, like Paris, right? Okay, so Paris was demolished and then rebuilt in the 18, what, 1870s, right? So, and since then, 
there are areas of Paris there's been very little change. So there's all this uniformity. And that creates, it's a beautiful space, and it all looks alike. And everybody holds it up as, as a model. I mean, it's an incredible place. In, in the US, in small towns where change happens, that, that, that does not happen. So our story is about change in many ways. It's about how, how do we adapt the buildings around us to maintain a, a character. But as that happens, if you don't protect the old stuff as it ages, whether it's frozen in 1870 or it was changed in 1950, it will be obliterated and there will be none of that. So um, the, the part of the story to try to understand and to appreciate is that the evolution is part of the story. So going back to the airliner, so the airliner was a building that had all of that Victorian stuff on it. Um, so it had you know tall and narrow windows and big, um, they called them window hoods and a big cornice. So it was very elaborate and decorative, right? And the reason that it was changed was because the people that owned the airliner bought that building. They wanted that building to reflect them, their character. They wanted it to reflect a change in an era, a change in thinking. So. If you look at the building and all you see is a flat building with one window in it, then you're missing part of the story, which is why does it look the way it does? What does the way it looked tell me about what was going on in my town at that time? Now, not everybody's interested in making that intellectual exercise or, or interested in, you know, I mean, that, it's true and there's, that's not a bad thing, it's a fact. But um, if we want to tell the story of a community, then we have to embrace the range of a period of time. And if we don't protect those, then they'll be gone and all we'll have is, is new stuff. And I like new stuff. I'm not against new construction. I'm really sorry I keep doing that. I have very busy hands. Um, but there is a place for protecting what tells the story that we've already lived through, too. Could I, help at could, all? I, could I follow up on that in a way I think might help? I think you're exactly right in drawing attention to the centrality of urban renewal uh, in this, uh, pertaining to this question that mm -hmm. we're dealing with. Uh, prior to World War II, this city just kind of grew very slowly. Buildings changed very slowly. It was a process of evolution. Mm -hmm. After World War II, there was a piece of federal legislation uh, enacted in 1949 and then amended in 1954 that made urban renewal a big thing and in city after city all around the United States and Europe, major, for different reasons, major swaths of, of older neighborhoods and downtowns were obliterated, to mm -hmm. use your verb, Alexa, just completely ob obliterated. And a phrase that was used at the time was wipe the slate clean and make it new. So that mm -hmm. was the idea. And there actually was a proposal here in Iowa City to wipe out the, the whole core of downtown and replace it with an enclosed mall surrounded by parking. People here chose not to do that, and it's my understanding, I didn't live here then, but it's my understanding there was a huge battle there was. over that. There was even a booklet that was written about the battle. Yeah, and Roberta Lannenkamp still lives here. Mm -hmm. She helped write that brochure, I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and has, she tells me she's still doing work on it. Yeah. Anyhow, had it not been for that battle, the downtown would be dramatically different from the way it is now as an ensemble of buildings mm -hmm. and spaces. So you're exactly right in drawing attention to the importance of the Ped Mall. Instead of having the, the whole downtown wiped out and replaced with whatever, a mall or whatever, they chose to build a pedestrian mall. And like you, you, you said last night, uh, out of the... Uh, how, how, Two, how many? Uh, 200 of that study, 89% are gone. Yeah, out of 200 uh, other cities that created ped pedestrian malls, 
90 percent or whatever mm -hmm. uh, are now gone so ours and maybe boulder and maybe burlington vermont there's mm -hmm. just a few others that remain because it's so successful yeah. so I, I think it's really a brilliant stroke on your part to draw attention to the ped mall as being a contributing resource to the hysteric, historic, care, <laughs> hysteric, <laughs> <laughs> historic <laughs> character of the downtown. Yeah, so th that's crucial. And then there are individual buildings that likewise have changed, but they, they, they were changed in a way that did not obliterate their past, but instead sort of uh, embodied the, the, the process of change in their renovation. Mm -hmm. and I think that's true for the airliner, though I'm not a big fan of its facade. Still, it fits into the ensemble mm -hmm. yeah. on that street. Yeah. You know, uh, the other thing, I'll, I'm sorry, the other thing I'll throw out there is is that um, one of the, the tricks is that whole 2020 is, you know, hindsight is, hindsight gives you a perspective. So at the time that the airliner was changed, you can be sure that there were people that were unhappy about it and couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. When we look back at it historically, we see it as part of a piece of the larger story. Okay, that's great. The, the second question is, I know that the, the, green, the green boundary is uh, your recommendation of nomination of historic district, right? Yes. Um, but I see there is gray area where you said is, is non-contributing, right? Right, yes. Yeah. And uh, when, when, if, the, if this being like really went to the national registers and become designated as a national, uh, as a historic district, what's going to happen to those gray areas? Still, the people who own those gray areas can change them or no? Or the the um, impact to non-contributing resources uh -huh. in terms of controls over them are the same as the ones that are contributing. The 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 only reason they're included is because you know the district has to have relatively clearly and, and clean boundaries. So if you started cutting out all of the non-contributing, the boundary would be like this and it would just be unworkable. So you always have some non-contributing resources in a historic district. But the, the impact to them is no different than, than to contributing resources. But the benefit is not um, apply to them because th they wouldn't be able to apply for historic tax credits. Mm -hmm. So the benefit to there's no benefit to to a non-contributing resource, but there's also no controls over a non-contributing resource. But can the order change the way it looks? Yes. Okay. I'm curious about um, access for the disabled. I think in historic structures, it's my understanding that, you know, like you have a, I don't mean to call them out, but Mickey's, for example, they have a downstairs bathroom. And my understanding, the reason why they can do that is if they're grandfathered in. Um, but there are certain triggering points in terms of the amount of remodeling you do that may then trigger the ADA requirements. Um, in terms of that piece, in terms of access for the disabled for the second and third, when someone wants to renovate, are you aware, are there any particular programs that allow additional tax credits to ensure that if you are doing one of those historic re renovations, um, that, that, is, that there would be additional benefits if you're doing the, the ADA or piece of it? I wouldn't say that there are additional benefits, but in, in the... Um, example that a National Register listed resource applied for historic state and federal or state or federal, one or the other, or both tax credits, the expense of adding an elevator or ADA accessibility would be considered a qualified rehabilitation okay. expense, and so the tax credit would apply against mm -hmm. that as well. Perfect. Um, the other possibility, which I, I have no experience in, but if, if I was in that boat or, or helping someone do that, I would look in to see whether or not there were any programs that would provide additional funding. Because I think that that's a big challenge, I think, for the Deadwood. From time to time, that's been looked at as there's that beautiful space up above. But I think that the elevator piece has been pointed out from time to time. So yeah. thank you for answering um, my question. I would su would, I'm surprised there's not a, a freight elevator in that building that could be converted. Do you know if the um, International Building Code has has any 
I know I spoke to Mark Ginsburg, he, he owns property on Washington, and he pointed, he gave me a wonderful tour of his building, it's a remarkable place, and said, John, you know, the, I wanted to put an elevator in, but I, you know, it doesn't work to apply the standard conventional elevator type. Mm -hmm. And and so I checked with some of my sources and didn't get get anywhere with that, but uh, I was, have you, are you familiar with the International Building Code? Is that something? that might allow a smaller, basically a smaller elevator that would accommodate situations like Mark's? Um, I'm going to defer that to Jessica. Maybe she, and maybe she, she doesn't want to speak to it. But I am familiar with with the um, that the situation with Mark Ginsburg's building. He attended one of the meetings, and we had a little bit of a discussion about that. Um, and my recommendation to him at that time was that that being on the National Register and going through the historic tax credit process is a tool to help answer some of those questions because then you're on a path where you're talking to the State Historic Preservation Office, you're ta talking to the National Park Service, you're presenting the issues that you have and they will help you um, with design solutions or potential examples. Now that, I'm not saying that that would have resolved his issue, mm -hmm. but he, he lacked that benefit at mm -hmm. the time. Right. So. Um, but I don't know if you have anything you Yeah, can the add. only other thing I would add, it's been a year since I've thought about his project, but I th I thought I remembered that maybe his, uh, the issue with his project was more related to the state fire marshal's requirements more than um, things that could han be handled a little bit more easily. So it might have been a larger issue where maybe if he had been uh, working towards tax credits, that extra assistance of that person might have right. helped him in that conversation. But I, I think it was a larger fire marshal issue, maybe. And the, the other... Um the other thing about about the existing building code is change of function also plays into this. So if you go from a retail to a house to housing, there there are other things at play. So it's one of those. I mean, in any case, you, you have to evaluate a building for it, you know in, in in isolation to be able to come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. And whether there would have been different ones for him, I, I can't say. But. Right. Alexa, in the Q&A last night after your presentation, someone asked about next steps. What are the next steps? That, that, that was the question that was asked. And it, 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 there did not seem to be clarity in the response last night at the presentation. And I'm not blaming anybody for that. I'm just saying what I think is a fact. So uh, instead, people said, OK, so the council is going to be meeting in a work session this morning. and. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there was still a lack of clarity, but you've been pretty clear, I think, about your recommendations to us. And maybe you could go back to that one slide where the, the, the you know the the f your set of recommendations. Yeah, right there. Proceed with National Register nomination of proposed district. So. Um, like I said earlier, we're not in a position here today to take a vote or uh, make really strong statements as a council, uh, but, but I think it's, you're, you're making very clear recommendations about how we should proceed, and it, that seems to me, speaking only as myself here, uh, this indicates that it would be good for the Historic Preservation Commission to take up your recommendations and to vet them in a, to a degree that they think is appropriate and then return to us with specific recommendations concerning whether to apply for a National Register nomination and whether to create, initiate the process of creating an historic landmark district mm -hmm. here, a uh, local landmark district here. Uh, is that would that be consistent with your recommendations? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, so. Um, hmm. I, I, I still yeah, have I, one question. Well, I would just say that. Um, yeah, I, we're, we're getting back to I think what would be the next steps and kind of um, underlaying that. And from my point is, perspective is is based on your survey and the sense that we we see over time this gradual erosion and, and um, diminishment 
uh, and reduction in size of the historic character of the downtown. And last night, I mean, you, there was this, I felt a real sense of urgency in your, your interpretation of what, need, what those next steps should be. Uh, you know, and you also mentioned today, which you did not mention last night, steps other Iowa City, I, state, cities in the state of Iowa have taken. Um, you also mentioned the staying power of historic commercial districts, you know, that they, and that, that speaks to me of how, you know, the changes in the commercial district, the nature of commercial districts that we have now, uh, commercial districts where there's an emphasis on convenience and there are commercial districts which provide the services but also emphasize the experience of being in that commercial district and that's where historic districts come into play. It's a, it's a pleasurable experience. So without being taken into account and the sense of urgency, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm very supportive of the recommendations which are pretty comprehensive. They go beyond the um, question of the nomination both at the local landmark and national register, but also just as, you know, as a city and as a community are f the putting an emphasis on not only the preservation, but what I see is opening up some of the untapped potential of the downtown in terms of its alleyways. Uh, we're working on the streets. You know, that's not part of your survey, but I think improving the streetscapes of the downtown are a very important piece and a reflection of our commitment. Uh, and development opportunities, which I think haven't received sufficient exploration. You know, the, the idea that these deep lots with alley access provide uh, an opportunity kind of in a way similar to what we've talked about with the missing middle. You know, there, there are ways in which we can think about development in the downtown that I don't know have been given sufficient consideration, but I think with, with <coughs> coupling it with the, you know, some of these, the tax incentives and so forth um, may show, f bear fruit as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So th to me, this has been a wonderful starting point, you know, at the assessment, all the, the richness of the history of you know, the six, six eras, you know, we sort of think of it as historic, but then when you break it down, it's like there are these different languages speaking to one another in an interesting way that embody our living history. So, I, you know, and it's, it's an urgent situation. I, I just, I want to stress that. I have a couple of questions, I think maybe more for Jessica from a staff perspective, and, and maybe for you, Lex, as well. If I'm understanding this correctly, and as you said, it's complex, and if it's not what you do with, for your livelihood, <laughs> um, getting all the nuances straight. The National Historic District designation, um, if I'm correct, does nothing except open up financial opportunities and grant opportunities. It puts no restrictions on the properties themselves. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. It's not quite the, not quite true, given what you said, because if you get financial incentives, right. then you yeah. know. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, I get that. I get that piece. But just doing the Priority. district itself mm -hmm. puts on no restrictions. It simply opens up those financial opportunities. So it would be, it would be honest and comprehensive to say, say it, and if, if you're talking to your constituency about this, and people who can, are maybe potentially concerned about those, it would be honest, thoroughly honest to say it exactly the way that you did. Okay. If, and this is not necessarily the second step, but although it's, it's a little bit vague, you say proceed with local landmark designations. Okay. If we proceeded with a local landmark district, then am I correct in understanding that every building in here that other than, uh, let me ask the question, what buildings in here, in this district, would not be subject to review by historic preservation if they were wanting to make uh, changes to the outside of the building? The gray area. So the way that it would work would, would depend on what our boundary for our local district was. If it was the same boundary as the National Register. Let's assume that to start. Okay, for now, we can assume that. Then um, 
we would also adopt a set of guidelines for review. And we would assume that anything in the district would be in some way reviewed. Uh, if it's a non-contributing building, just like we do with our residential areas, there are certain things that they can do that maybe a contributing building would not be able to do. And that might involve, as well, demo and new construction. It might, um, we could, I know that um, building heights has been something that has been discussed widely in the city. When we develop our guidelines, we could determine that we have a height limit or not. And then those things might be reviewed as well. Generally, if you have a local overlay district, anything that's within that space would be subject to review with that review conditioned upon what the historic character is, what the status contributing, non-contributing, non-historic, you know, what the status was. There'd be different levels of review. Okay. Third question. Am I understanding correctly that we could either with or without the National Register District, we could proceed with local landmark designations of individual properties within this area? Yes, we could. I'm, I'm not adverse necessarily to, to having like the historic preservation work on the, the National Registry. Um, I, I want to get a lot more input from the public. I want to get a lot more input. I didn't have the opportunity to go to the uh, event last night. I had a conflict. Um, I, I will say at this point, I would certainly have significant, significant reservations on a local landmark district um, because of the significant restrictions that could put on the majority of properties in that area. And, and it's not that I don't want to see them preserved, but I also, when I look at that map and I look at how much is yellow and red and blue, which are the key contributing, the contributing and the individually eligible, if I'm recalling these all correctly. And at the same time, we talk about, did I not get that right, Jeff? I saw you kind of shaking. The black is the contributing. Oh, I'm sorry. The black blue is, the is already listed. They guessed it. Yeah. The, so the blue, the black, oh, I'm sorry. The blue, actually, the blue, the black, the red, and the yellow. It's four colors. Okay. Those four colors. Um, and at the same time, we talk about evolution. And, and I realize you know, from what you said, Jim, part of that evolution was maybe in the further back years. And yes, there was the urban renewal and that did some things that impacted this district and, and mostly actually in a very positive way. We're lucky in this in terms of this particular district. But when I look at this and look at the high percentage of buildings that are those four colors and the idea of putting a local landmark overlay on this or do we, my concern is we almost stop the evolution and we, we kind of freeze these buildings in time and, and may really signific may significantly limit um, changes in evolution as we go forward. Again, before, I'm, I'm not ready to make any decisions and obviously we need a recommendation, but I just lay that out there because I would need, I need a lot of input from the community and from the property owners within this district. They, they've invested a whole lot of money, and I think that is something that also has to be taken into account. At the same time, I want to give them all the tools um, to renovate and make changes and, and maintain as much of that as we possibly can. If I can. I was just going to jump in and say, if you don't mind, um, that, that the, the one misconception I want to make sure that we get out there is, is that, in my mind, um, the goal of the local overlay would not be to freeze a building in time. It would be to provide some guidance and controls about how those changes are made. So it doesn't mean that a building can't be changed. And I think the example that Jessica gave of the Kreskis and the Yonkers building, which have been you know, a point of considerable discussion, many people talk to me about those buildings, um, that, that is a, a place that's been looked at very hard about redevelopment. So how is it, um, the, the overlay in my mind then, 
um, insists upon a discussion about what those look like and how is it that we modify a historic building to continue that evolution while maintaining a historic character that's in keeping with the historic character of the downtown. So I think it's important to, to state that, that an overlay district is not a, a, stop, a complete stoppage of evolution. I think, I think it comes to the details of how it's Absolutely. implemented. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I, and I think, and, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I'll just give you an example of why I think a lot of people in this town would not necessarily agree with what you're saying in terms of how that would be applied okay. here. If I am c remembering correctly, we had an application on a siding on a house in a, I believe, a historic district that I believe, if I recall correctly, was non-conforming, and there was an issue between the type of siding that could be allowed. Mm -hmm. And I think the property owners very much felt that what they wanted to do actually fit within the time frame of when the house was built, but it had since been changed. And, and I don't remember all the details, but there, there definitely are different perceptions mm -hmm. about how restrictive we are being as a city with our ordinances and with the application of those guidelines that make, I think, a lot of people very uncomfortable with allowing the city to have that much oversight on their property. Understood. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I just get really confused in one thing after <laughs> Suzanne said, because, you know, you, uh, my understanding if we proceed on national like historic registration for this uh, the um, the district that you outlined by the green boundary uh, this is does not put like any the guidelines it could be completely different when we do a local landmark designation right yes because we set our guideline yes but uh, for just to register it as national register, we go by their guideline, which is national register does not refund property owner from demolition and all this kind of the thing that you have it over there. But those could be different when we do the local landmark designation as a local here, right? That like our guideline could be different; it doesn't have to be the same, right? Okay, that's the, the, just clarification. And here, the, the, my, my question is really, I know there is many, many apartment building on that district, that if we want to do it. And I know the people who live there, most of them, they don't care if they, if they are living in historic building or not. But they care because they have another like priorities that maybe they live there because they are close to the university. They like to live in a downtown area, and all these kind of things. Um, if we proceed with this, what the is this gonna affect the price? Like if we say this is historic district, the price of renting or anything, is it going to be different from now? And if we change it, because I know like, for example, for new building, all the new building come up here, the price will be high. Yeah. But you know, that's why I guess if we make it historic, the price wise will be changed or not, or I don't know. I don't think that there is any, um statistics that say the mere fact of designating a historic district drives up rent prices. Okay. I, I would say that competition is what drives up prices. Um, and so in the case that a building owner, because it went on the National Register, did a historic rehabilitation and they, so then they have an investment, a financial investment that they're going to want to recoup, then in that case, it could result in higher rent prices. I'd also like to point out that in, in many communities, um, that there are statistics emerging that millennials are looking for historic buildings to live in, in downtowns. Now, there's a lot of conversation about how viable um, or, or um, can't think of the right word, but downtown living is in, in Iowa City because of the uh, the lively uh, evenings. But but certainly, um, new construction is imitating 
I mean, they loft style, um, and they're imitating historic buildings. So I do think that in some ways that can be a marketing tool for downtown housing. But um, in terms of putting it down the National Register, I don't have any reason to think that's going to trigger high prices. Renovation mm -hmm. might. Might. Yeah. I would like to add to that because actually if you had a historic building and you did remodeling things that you needed to do and it's not on the National Register, you can't use tax credits, you as an owner take in that cost and then you probably raise your rent. Rents. If you have a historic building in a National Register district and you take advantage of the tax credits and some of the other exemptions that you can get, that reduces your cost. Mm -hmm. So then maybe you don't need to add your remodeling costs to your rents. So it might actually keep rents stable in a remodeled building, but I don't know. Sure. Thanks. It seems to me there's no downside whatsoever to pursuing the National Register designation. Uh, the, the boundaries need some vetting and some thought, but I, I just don't see a downside to proceeding with that. But my guess is that the, 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 the commission, the Historic Preservation Commission, needs some guidance from us about whether they should proceed with doing the kind of vetting that Susan rightly points to uh, th with regard to the historic landmark designation or local landmark designation. There's a lot that needs to be done on that. A lot of stakeholders need to be talked to. There, some careful thought needs to be put on into the boundaries of such a district and so on. Uh, but it would seem to me that we should signal to the commission that we want them to proceed with both, but being really cautious with the historic, with the local landmark part, so that the kind of vetting that that is needed actually takes place. So uh, I'm wondering if the rest of you agree or disagree with that. Is that, again, the most efficient way to do it, is to do the two at the same time, or would you more naturally do the national first and then approach the local landmark second? Our community has tended to do the National Register nomination first because that nomination can then be the historic document we use to um, say that our local area is eligible. They could also be done at the same time. The National Register process is probably a year-long process. Our local process would involve so many public meetings that it would also be lengthy. Um, I don't know if it would be a, a year-long or not or something. It could be done concurrently um, or consecutively, either one, really. If I could jump in, uh, the, the thing I would uh, that occurs to me is that because we have um, a solid recommendation about what we think the boundary will be, it may be nuanced. They have the foundation to start that process, because I agree, it's, there's a lot of consideration, a lot of communication um, that needs to be to be done. So they already have in their hand, without the National Register being completed, I think, the foundation that they need to begin those discussions. That doesn't mean that they're going to dovetail and end at the same time, it, um, but, but the National Register process is certainly a full year. So um, my money would be, be on getting that conversation started, especially since we're at a point now where it's in people's thinking. People are aware that the process is going on. There is a sense of urgency. I certainly feel that and have communicated that. Um, so I think it's important to strike while the iron is hot while people are having these conversations. So I would recommend that that conversation starts. My sense is, too, is that I thought at the beginning of this we said that we weren't going to provide any affirmative direction. We were just going to ask questions. Um, uh, though to the extent that we do want to provide any, I mean, I think that we've had a two-hour presentation. It'd be nice if we could have some more time to give the direction. But certainly, I would agree with you, Jim. There seems to be no downside whatsoever in terms of the National Register. Since we're talking about buildings, I'd sort of like to use the building concept of phasing or staging, perhaps. It seems like to me that the register is the foundation.
foundation of what we want to do, and that's likely going to be the least politically sensitive. So I'd like to start with that to provide our foundation, um, and maybe not wait till the end of the National Register historic process, but in staff's discretion, start the landmark, the more complicated thing, maybe six months in or something like that, um, but staff would decide subject to our review and input. Um, because it seems like to me, I, we've had a nice, thoughtful discussion. I think a lot of people com confuse this landmark and registration. We've been able to sit here for two hours and understand all that nuance, but I'm really afraid that in this historic discussion, this landmark piece is going to is going to drive so much of the controversy that we won't address this simple. I think. Pretty much, I think everyone would want register a national register of nomination, unless they think somehow, in the end, it will make it more likely that you would have a landmark process. So that's what I'd like to do to the extent we want to make register first, and then at some point in the future, subject to staff's assessment of conditions in their own time, the landmark discussion could begin. What do the rest of you think about that? I, I also agree with the national registers first. You know, this is, but you know, I really always think we here as a council do not uh, uh, do what the best for the public actually, and not and the best for the public it cannot be decided by us only uh, without them being like a voice on this. My understanding that you have many meetings, you reach out to a lot of people that you listed out, which is great. But you know, I still encourage, I guess, to add my voice to what our mayor and Susan Mim said. You know, reach out to more people at the downtown district. I encourage the historic Brisbane commission also to do the same thing and let us really figure this out come to common ground where we can satisfy people you know like the, the where we our vision is as a city and also the people who are owner of this you know his you know buildings and historic area and the downtown district and everyone you know, on this, I, I really want to see those kind of things being ha like happening, and people start coming to a common ground for what we need to do as a local, uh, you know, landmark designation. But registration, national register, I'm um, for it. Yeah. I agree with that too, and, and uh, Susan's comments about hearing more from the downtown businesses. I see Nancy. Nancy's in the audience here, and. Uh, we didn't really hear from from the business perspective. You said there were about 45 people there last night. I don't know what percentage of that uh, were from the downtown businesses, the owners, or was it general public? Four, four to five? Four or five. Oh, OK, OK, because I think it would be good to hear a little more from, from those owners and those businesses. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the basic National Register nomination, but as far as uh, proceeding with the local landmark designations, mm -hmm. it would be good to hear from some of the business Absolutely. owners. I would only say, Pauline, I think we need to hear from them on the national designation as well. I mean, I, they, if they don't buy in and understand, it's going to make <laughs> any continued process, I think, even harder. And so I, I think they should be involved and have some input as well. And I'll say that that there that part of the process in order for it to be registered is is that that we do have to have their approval. Um, you know, if there's a uh, is it 51, I'm blanking on what the percentage is, but but. But people can lodge um, their opposition to be included in the National Register. But we, we do need their support. So however that's done, um, you know, I certainly think that people need to be brought in from the beginning. Um, and I think, Rockney, the, the, the point that you made about any opposition to the National Register, I do think that it, it, it's once they understand that they're, that it's a no street thing, the only, the only potential that I see is that they see it as a wedge that's going to push them into something that they don't want. So I do think it's important to allay that fear from the front, from the beginning. Um, you know, because I, I do think that still lays out there. Okay. I think we've probably covered enough territory for the day. I guess anybody else wants to say anything else? No? Okay. Alexa, thanks so much. Thank for the you. Great work I appreciate you've done. it. Thank you. And yeah, and staff will have to will have to have some conversations so, in one way or another. So we'll we'll take this to the Historic Preservation Commission. The, the chairman's in the audience here. He heard your discussion, and and they'll just go through each of her 
recommendations and uh, eventually report back to you with either a process or their own thoughts on each one of those items. Okay. Yep. 